Okay, I'm Persephone Hartrick, and this is my poem about America. America is a miscarriage. The family still grieves, but the world looks on and laughs at how long they have waited for them to come back. America remains a cadaver, sat out on a table, rotting. And now America's would-be home has absorbed the smell of rot in the walls like whiskey draws flavor from a barrel. Slowly, but noticeably. America. Its tiny legs, which it could have used to run some day, sprawled out motionless. The family tries to forget it, but they sit around the table and eat, making ever so often the casual glance at the husk of soul. The outside asks why the family still lives in the house. They say it's perfectly serviceable, it's just that America's not. The next question being, why don't you do something about America? And for that, they shut the door. America's body is on display through a window in the dining room. It's open for all to see, but the fence is hard to get through. Some members of the family like to pretend that America is growing and healthy and alive, but it's easy to see through. When the outside does manage to see America, it's a mix of pity and sadness and fear, maybe a touch of dark humor. America was never and will never be large, but the rot makes it scary. You may be worried it will spread, or maybe you have the worry that past death America will kick. And when it's found alive, all we can do is pray that the ambulance comes fast enough, the siren pulling on the air until it's as taut as the noose the mother hung herself with when her idea was undone. In the fourth grade, I had made a figure of clay. As art class started, my eyes darted towards the tools as I entered the fray. On the outside, so structurally sound, all too profound, it couldn't possibly break. Not this opaque mound. I was sure it wouldn't shake, even in the presence of an earthquake. Air pockets filled with air pressure, so much for being so sure as the fissures began generating. My clay creation did not survive. I needed to revive, resurrect, and protect. But all I could do now was collect. The many pieces my art piece was in, not at all at peace. To see all the cracks and creases didn't put me at ease as I stood there speculating, investigating, contemplating my next move. I thought of all the ways to save, to salvage my creation, my beauty. I thought of Kintsugi, hot glue gold to mend precious scars on my bowl. But I wasn't sure I had the ability within the class to reconstruct my fading barricade, whose resilience was low. Hoping for a miracle, a long shot, for blue, bold, breathless stars to make what was cracked whole. As reality set in, and so did the end of my porcelain. Thrown in the trash, smashed to pieces, unfixable, even with adhesive. America is exploding clay in a kiln, on the outside, impenetrable, but bursts open due to the pressure of the ignored. While this outcome is not yet set in stone, what's left unchecked will grow stamping out the light on a once bright future. America can become better than ever, a great treasure, but that will only come true if a change comes too and equality is restored. In the fourth grade, I had made a figure out of clay. I didn't know how it would relate to today, but all I can say is that it's easier to break than to create. Hi, my name is Victoria, and my poem is called Intersectionality. Intersectionality, the idea that discrimination is like a language, spoken in many different tongues. Those that speak one get one hand, but the second is hard to understand. I get many hands, three to be exact, and it can be a little difficult. Walking in the street, I need to keep my eyes on my feet, no hoodie, so no one presses delete, but I also need to stand up straight, hide feminine traits, and assimilate to avoid being raped. Simultaneously accomplish both until I reach home, where there are no tongues of hate or worry of not being straight. Just me. I hope to be great. An attempt to translate. Hi, I'm Joshua Wood, and this is my poem, Where I'm From. Where I'm from, my throne and the homegrown cornerstones of where I roamed are still unknown. My past is a decode of my genome and my ancestors' headstones. The monochrome, long-forgotten abode so lost in another time zone, a blind zone, and the buried episodes of my postcode make me implode. I need a re-roll because truly, I don't know where I'm from. Where I'm from, I'm known best. I'm from the Midwest, while my fam's at rest mere oceans away. I detest where I'm addressed so far from half-obsessed family mess. I ingest that I'm truly blessed for the chance to reset, a refresh, I digress. But so I manifest, hope rid of my distress and ancestry theft because still, I don't know where I'm from. 
where I'm from, I walk back along symbolic train tracks to unpack what I know I really am. Around this world I backpack straight from the tarmac to seek that in which are the real facts. My life is an almanac, complete with knickknacks or maniacs and pitch black, overwhelmed looking through the cracks, a heart attack, a union jack. I swear I'm no insomniac, and yet so, I still don't know where I'm from. Where I'm from, my home is a free throw, not upper below, somewhere you can't go. My life is music, it's got a tempo, allegro, fortissimo. All that's left now is to outgrow, quite like Van Gogh or an embryo. Bring my inner circle as we undergo the life flow. Look to tomorrow, my essence in England or Indo, to the place we sit named Chicago. I finally know where I'm from. Thank you. Stavian Rodriguez. Yesterday, someone with my last name was killed. Bullet battered until he couldn't breathe. Those weapons fired by the same reason Laquan McDonald went down. The same reason George Floyd could not breathe. Mercilessly mauled by white hoods hiding under blue badges. That reason is no good reason. And that's why it pushed a gun to my temple, told me not to breathe when a little boy asked if I was Mexican and his mother kept on breathing freely without my answer. Each of my classmates were lovingly stroked by the reason's hands, whispering, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's not okay, I begged my father to yell, but I, we, were outnumbered. So, as they said my best friend smelled, called her a Wakandan elephant, asked me to help them with their Spanish homework, tangled their hands into my hair to brush out the curls for me, said, called, asked, did. We didn't breathe. But it was only when Laquan, George, Brianna, and other good enough evidence was presented. It was only when they checked the pulse did they realize that reason was no good reason. Did they realize it's not okay? Did they stop saying, calling, asking, and doing? Did they realize we couldn't breathe? It was only when they took the shot. Did they realize what they had done to my last name? Hello, my name is Simone, and today I'm going to be presenting a poem about um, how I feel sometimes walking home alone at night. Picture this, I'm walking home from a friend's place at night, just a few blocks away. My home is safe, warm, welcoming. Picture that, now picture this. Picture the way my feet speed up at any little sound from behind, the way my shoulders tense as any car drives by, the way my knuckles turn white, gripping keys between my fingers, just in case. Just in case that sound from behind was something or someone dangerous. Just in case that passing car were to stop, my pace quickens even more. Just two more blocks to go. A stick snaps behind me. Nothing. A sigh of relief. A quick look around, just in case. I turn down the alley. Two more houses to go. I picture my room. It's warm, comforting, safe. That word, safe, it doesn't mean much to me most of the time. But every now and then, as I close and lock the door of my house, picturing things that could have happened. I wonder if that word really matters, and I hope to God that it does. I unlock and relock the door again, just in case. Hello, I'm Sarah May Fieser, and Miss Del Fieco's fourth period English class, and this is my poem. America is a sitcom that's been running for too long, but everyone is still watching. The same storylines repeating, a moment in science class opening new slides when someone says, it's just like opening your new iPhone, and everyone understood what he meant. This is the setting for my story, the premise I was born into. So hard to see the episode when you're in it. In a moment, I could step out and join the audience. Then I, then I see that I am typecast as the good guy in ways I didn't earn. I can count on the story going my way. Not everyone gets their happy ending. So many plot lines never seen, so many stories never told. So many people treated like supporting characters, like supporting is all they can do, like supporting is all they have access to. And me in my cushy dressing room, 
Who will drive my action? Will I be protagonist or pixie? Tuning in for the reruns that everyone has already seen. Tired of the laugh tracks. The jokes aren't funny. The fans are trapped in the studio. The whole world has to watch the America show. Grand Buffet always used to sing Chicago and say that he was Mr. Cellophane because you could look right through him, walk right by him, and never know he was there. He was the rapping, transparent and airtight, ziplocking our stories and preserving a generation. Every time he was talked over, looked past for something more vibrant, colorful, people missed a diamond for plastic wrap. Why is it that the kindest of hearts hear the cruelest of words, or why that which is the spirit is so often forgotten? But he just smiled. I now stand as the sun shines through the air in a dusty room, the room that used to be his, and I think it's those subtle reflections, bends in the light that changed people to see beyond what they thought was Mr. Cellophane. So my poem is called Brown Girl. <laughs> so America's people looking at me with their heads cocked. They see a brown girl who's not brown enough. They see a brown girl who hides her flesh like camouflage and hunt. She doesn't hunt, but the brown girl wishes that every deer wore a bulletproof vest and fired back. Where must this brown girl stay? I mean, they don't know whether to help her or point her away like a scarecrow. Her blood is like water and oil. It just doesn't flow. They blow her like a tornado whichever way the wind blows. Which part of her will make decisions today? Which aspect of her personality will blend the least of work and succeed? This girl is a different type of breed. I mean, she's a woman with roots from both African and Spanish-speaking ancestry. She can't check herself into a box. She'd be ignoring the mommy straight and her papi nappy locks in her. She'd be ignoring the Midwest Windy City in her. She'd be ignoring the taina con the lola in her. She'd be ignoring the salsa con sabor in her. She'd be ignoring waking up to freshly cooked arepas in her. She'd be ignoring those hips moving to merengue when it's Elano in her. She's a mix of a lot of different colors in her. It's like this brown girl is undercover. Pick one or choose other. <laughs> My name is Matthew Munoz. I am period A English, and this is my rap. <clears throat> the gun violence is shy, looking at the news and somebody else died. I don't find any of that surprise, and one day he's alive, the next day his family's crying. It's a tough place to be, knowing that if you do something wrong, your life is a fee. Me and my friends playing in the street to come up, and my stuff is what they keep. It's just more and more shots, more bodies that rot. No one found him, but once they do, he's going to spend a lifetime in the cop. But sometimes you can't trust the cops. They've been the ones shooting the shots. They shot an innocent black man because he was playing basketball in the back of a lot. My head is just spinning, like why are these people killing? Sometimes it just hurts, that's always the feeling. I stand up for myself because nobody can be stopping me. I always think to myself, it must be the poverty. If someone hurts you, I'm fighting for your safety. I don't want to hurt, but I will never run and flee. I want to keep my loved ones safe. I don't want any of them to get baked. But since this is the world we live in, that's how our world is going to break. My name is Mihan Garcia Gonzalez, and I'm in second period English honors with Mr. Quick. And I'm a freshman. I thought that if I stirred hard enough, maybe the letters of my name on the yellow folded name tag sitting propped up at the edge of my new third grade desk would one day jumble up to magically spell Ava or Amy or Ariana or Anna. Their names spilled out like smooth honey. They ran out of mouths, past lips, and into the air, articulating an effortless pronunciation without hesitation. Amihan, Amahan, Amihan, here. Please more emphasis on the me and please shape your mouth smaller to create an uh sound. My name would leave their lips and the letters would come storming out of their mouths, each one violently blowing in the classroom until heavy rain poured down into a pool of water on the floor. They don't know that in Tagalog, my name means the northeast monsoon, a seasonal shifting of winds that could bring great destruction to towns, but also create the slightest humid breeze on a summer night in the city of Manila. I guess I'm a monsoon, not Allison or Amy or Ava, I'm the gentle harvest wind, but also the loud and thundering north wind. America is a cottage trapped on a hill of despair, with only quicksand there to help you reach the top. She said, those people can burn in hell. My people. Skin's so dark, they blend in with the tar they use to burn them alive. She said, they need to come here the right way. The privilege ringing out, her peach skin reading the words of slave masters before. She says, I'm not racist. No. We argue like the turkey and cheese in between our sandwiches. The roar of the lunchroom is never louder than the racism in her soul. Their pale faces stalking my nightmares. America's for the people of cold stone ash, not for the people who've been pushed into the shadows. 
Then there's us. They hold guns to our heads, but taunt us while fiddling with the trigger. Then by accident, it happens. All is gone for the man who's gonna go pick up his daughter from school. She never even said goodbye. She still waits on the sidewalk with butterfly barrettes in her hair. He got lost in the quicksand and sank. He never even got to say goodbye. He never got to see America from the top of the hill. He thought the quicksand was the only way, but it turns out there were stairs on the other side just for them. That's what happens when you're not one of those people of cold stone ash. Hi, I'm Carmen Jimenez Smith, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the poems that I heard you read. These videos were fantastic, and I was really impressed with the range of approaches, the metaphors, and the passion. Each of these poets spoke to me for different reasons, and I was definitely inspired as a poet. I was also so grateful to hear these poems read as living embodiments of art. I loved Victoria's use of the surreal three hands. Persephone's bleak landscape reminded me of William Butler Yeats and made fantastic use of the macabre. Matthew wrote a really strong rap with great rhymes of defiance and hope. Joshua's poem employed terrific consonants, consonants and, was a ter and gave a great performance. Ashley's poem had memorable lines like people of the stone cold ash and really beautiful turns. I enjoyed and was moved by Simone's enactment of fear and anxiety. The finalists for me brought lots of different energies and powers to their work, surprising and inspiring me. In fifth place is Luke Lazara. I loved the sound of this poem as well as the use of an extended metaphor that served many purposes in the poem. There was terrific music and wonderful sensual detail in this strong political poem. In fourth place is Amy Phelan. This poem contains such tenderness and the surprise of evolving images that struck me as vibrant and alive as the story it told. In third place, Amihan Garcia Gonzalez. This poem spoke to me from the get-go in its exploration of misidentification and mispronunciation. It moved from the local to the global, from the immediate to the historical in resonant images. In second place, Mia Rodriguez. This is a poem of far-reaching inscription that also deftly incorporates the heartbreaking truths of racism, moving seamlessly across the public and the private. And the winner for me was Miranda Ramos. Hers was an expansive and spirited poem. Its wild music drew from the high and the low in its code-switching exuberance. I love the boldness of this poem and the power of its delivery. This was a very, very hard decision to make. I had lots of different lists and lots of different reasons for loving these poems, but I'm so grateful for the chance to have listened to you and learned from you. Thank you. Hi, so I have the results of the 2021 Freshman Slam competition. Um, this was very hard to judge. These are really good poems, uh, strong poets, important work. Uh, that always makes it harder. Um, so I wish I could have uh, just said everyone was a winner, uh, but I had to choose five. And I had to watch these videos over and over again to try to get it down to just five. Um, I used the, the um, criteria of thinking about what this would look like on the page, um, how it would hold up on the page, because a lot of great slam poets um, publish. Uh, the other thing I thought about was um, titles. Uh, there weren't many titles, but the ones that had titles, I thought um, that did help the poem along. Um, I always believe the poem begins with the title first. Um, and um, also just thinking about it as a, as a poem itself um, and not some other um, art form. Um, I, I didn't think of it as a rap or anything like that, but as a poem. And, uh, and these were strong. They all held up uh, under, under that scrutiny. Um, uh, in fifth place, uh, there's Victoria Cross. Uh, in fourth place, Persephone Hartridge. Um, number uh, three and third place, Miranda Ramos. Uh, in second place, Amihan Garcia Gonzalez. And in first place, 
drum roll, Mia Rodriguez. Um, so uh, what I liked about these poems, um, first of all, with uh, Victoria Cross, I thought, you know, just the way that she was able to weave um, some narrative throughout this kind of lyrical uh, progression, I thought that was brilliant. Um, and it was also just so, uh, the, the, what she was talking about, you know, was so important. Like she had that, that title, Intersectionality, but it was, it, it, it had a lot of emotion. So that moved me. Uh, with Persephone, um, Hartwick, I, I heard that, um, that form before, but uh, I felt like, you know, Persephone, you made it your own. And uh, I just love the extended metaphor within that and how well you wove it together. Um, Miranda Ramos, Brown Girl. That was a killer poem. And I, I love the delivery and everything. Um, you know, I, I, I said I wasn't, you know, into uh, having the poem as rap, and that's kind of a rap, but I also could see that poem holding up on the page. Um, and so, I, but I just love the energy behind it and everything. Um, Amihan Garcia Gonzalez. That that poem was, was beautiful. It, it's, uh, you know, once again, it's kind of part of that form, but you really made it your own, um, made it personal. Um, and it's not just about um, the name, but also about how that name connects to others and extends beyond yourself. So I just thought that was brilliant and beautiful. Um, that's what a poem is supposed to do. It's supposed to reach beyond you. And with that in mind, I have to say the same thing um, about our winner, uh, Mia Rodriguez, um, you know, taking the last name with the name of the, the young man who, who uh, was killed is something that, um, you know, that, that drawing that connection is a thing that we need to be doing more of uh, in society, thinking about how we are connected to these losses, um, whether we know the person or not, whether we share the same last name or not, uh, we're all connected. And so I thought that was the ultimate message um, that we needed to hear. Um, and it's hard to write a poem that's about what's happening now. And sometimes it's easier to write a poem about things in the past, but it's really hard to write about a poem, to write a poem about something that's happening in the moment. And, you know, that's our job though. You know, we have to chronicle the history and the culture of our times and, uh, you, you killed it with this poem. This is beautiful. Um, I think it's Stephen Rodriguez, I think is the name of the poem. Um, but all you did that, you know, you all, you all just really uh, dug deep and you came up with it and it was just beautiful. Um, I was happy and honored to, to um, hear your poems. Uh, all the finalists, not just the, the final five, but all the finalists. Uh, it was just, uh, I, I was moved by it and inspired by it. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your work. And, and please keep on. Hey, Oak Park Poets. My name is Kava Akbar. Um, I am a poet and a professor. And it was so, 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 so much fun and such an honor to be able to watch, listen to, experience, be illuminated by your poems. Um, I want to congratulate Miranda Ramos, the winner. Um, your poem was absolutely incredible. Your performance was incredible. The, the content of the poem, the form, um, the deafness of the code switching and the um, urgency of the message and the tenor of the delivery. It was just impeccable. Um, uh, so many of you wrote such incredible pieces and performed them brilliantly. And, uh, and I'm so excited to be able to be in a world writing alongside you. Um, you know, all 12 of these poems, I would have been thrilled, thrilled to receive from any of my students at the university that I teach, you know, undergrads and grad students, um, I would have been thrilled to receive these poems. Uh, you guys are tapped into a really important vein. Um, you're tapped into something really, really real and really, really urgent. And um, 
you know, language is what we have. Language is the material that we use. That's the technology that we use to communicate with each other. And you are all clearly, clearly, clearly gifted at it. And so I beg, I beg you to um, to keep tending to those gifts and um, and to keep deploying this language against an empire that would have you um, do otherwise, that would have you sit complicit. Um, you're all doing such vital, urgent, interesting, compelling, beautiful, deft work. It was such a profound privilege. I hope I have the opportunity to meet and congratulate each and every one of you in person. Um, and to thank you for letting me experience your poems. But until then, this will have to suffice. Thank you so much. Profound privilege. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shout out to PK as well. I'm going to read a poem from my recent collection. It came out in 2019 called Be Recorder. And I suppose what I'd say about it is that my interest in the poem was to write a poem about mental illness that wasn't melodramatic, but also that used an extended metaphor. And so you'll notice that there's a lot of reference to skies and stars and that kind of thing. So hopefully you can see how they work together. When I was a girl, I thought clouds were God and that we dialogued about sin, which mirrored my desires. When our talks made me paranoid, I counted the letters in each word I heard, turned them backward or rearranged them alphabetically to dodge the buzz of my head. Other times I was the sadder side of the coin and the air around me felt like jewels. Then abyss, pulling the hair from my head in a type of catatonia. My family thought I should lift myself with mind, lift myself from the bed, from the couch, as if the body were the mind's queen. We've seen the world, my family would tell me. In the world, suffering is hunger, war, disease, they said. And because those calamities were terrible, I was ashamed for the insignificance of mine. What I had, I had made, they said and I should cast it off like a snake molting skin. So I would try each of my atoms a ton, which led to a thought experiment at 11, death by pills. I survived woozy, but alive. No scar left, no redemption or courage, just shame so dark my ancestors called from the fathoms to ask why I sought out their shadows. To end a conversation, tell a story of suicide with a girl in it. She's a ghost desperate for absolution. When I was a girl, I wilted or blew. I burrowed into pain. When I was a girl, I thought my storm would suck me into its eye and uncoil me from what I was. When I was a girl, I worried about who knew I knew. I worried who I could hurt, so I hid myself. We are storms and bargains with heaven, pulses of electricity moving within infinite networks. So much fallibility. What do we bear that comes just from the world? And then what comes from inside us? We bear everything, each part. I loved the part when the world was my torrid lover seduced by the blue blaze beaming from my body. My eye helped me plow through the living room like a comet. I could burn down or out or air, and I could be such a good poet in it sometimes. I liked how brilliant the light words emitted stars I arranged in a sky like a god who would fall to the earth, having made something beautiful and vainglorious. Sometimes those were the days, the ones I could hold still long enough to arrange stars without the burn, but I cannot. I have in me a buried spark. I buried it myself. When I was a girl, I collected reams of paper soothed by the white over and over, the hope of starting from blank. I hoped to endure being well enough to conjure a new bright vessel because I wanted to live. Thank you. The title of the poem is Hex. 
It's um, trying to cast a spell uh, to stop the violence against people of color, particularly that violence inflicted upon them uh, by the police. Um, that's it. Oh, it's also, I, I was supposed to say something about craft. It's, um, it's written in six line stanzas uh, playing off the title Hex, you know, like Hexa, Hex. All right, here's the poem, Hex. The day of the spell was the day of cast shadows, of diaphanous figures whipped clean of fear, angels ablaze selling a coastline of hushed tete-a-tetes. Adagio tenor wails laced with rage, smoke rising from the wails from the laughter, just when the last local trains crawled into stations, just when televisions grew vertigris in homes, obsolete from indolence, just when black signatories erased their names and put on their boots, cirrus streaks formed on the skyline of the city. A mother held her barely alive son, the son to whom she vowed protection from harm. Having thrown a circle of goober dust to enclose her enemies, she raises a totem over her head. It's now time. Let her wield the words of black declensions, new vows, the best nouns of home training, of damn good sense. Let her sit for a spell, wipe sleep from her eye. Let her obtain a license for what's lethal from whatever God has taken her image. Whenever the sun comes over the buildings, whenever the moon weighs more than the sun, more than Pisces and Neptune, walk to a street corner with plenty of witnesses where you'll bear no isolation. Sing your words facing north or even higher. Now, walk backward through the chains of time from each past and current hindrance to our future. Invoke the names of those not seating privilege in boardrooms, the ones who oppress to their graves. Now summon each forgotten spirit, each fallen son. Bless each prayed up grandmother, each open door and vivid corridor. Bless the pains spared you, vicarious to you, passed down in your blood, carrying you through the dangers and the echoes of time. Remember, family echoes within your body. History pulls through you as you move through a day. Raise them in this prayer, let's call it, to that God who took your image. Go to the tree, to the home, to the street corner, and spread these words, tossing wreaths, spinning incantations, where torn life collapsed under a last breath. Thank you.